Okay, good morning again. Um, we are in Tanya chapter 41. Uh, chapter 41, as I mentioned last week, is one of the most popular chapters of Ta all of Tanya. It's a chapter that's that's being actually studied and reviewed on a daily basis for, for many Hasidim, many Yeshiva students meditate or learn this chapter by heart because it really goes to the core of what, how we prepare ourselves, especially before prayer, and especially before we start to study Torah. As we know, we learned in the beginning that every mitzvah that I do needs to have the infusion of kavana, of proper intention, proper meditation, proper understanding what I'm doing. Although the key factor in every mitzvah is to do the action, right? You got to do it. You got to light the candles. You got to give tzedakah. You got to um, hear the shofar, you're going to eat the matzah, but that is the body of the mitzvah. The soul of the mitzvah is to have the proper kavana, the proper intention and meditation while you're doing so. And he refers to the Zohar that having the intention, the kavana, needs to be infused with two wings. He calls it a, a wings, like the bird. You have a bird, a bird can exist without its wings, but it cannot fly without the wings. A mitzvah is very powerful. A mitzvah is a connection that we connect to Hashem. It's not just a deed, not just the action, but the action is just the is the vehicle how we connect to Hashem. When we talk about connection, we know that we have spiritual worlds, spiritual worlds, many spiritual worlds. Until we have the essence of Hashem that is not um, limited to anything, it's infinite, and we have our finite universe, our finite world. That is that on the outside doesn't look anything with anything spiritual, rather very much mundane. The, 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 the job and the mission is to take the mundane to do the mitzvah. So we now infuse the mundane, infuse the money that I have earned by giving tzedakah, and I elevate the money, I elevate myself to a to connect to Hashem. But that elevation part needs to basically have the wings that it can lift off and go higher. What are the wings? So you refer to the wings that every mitzvah needs to be done uh, out of love for Hashem and out of, av, av, we say love for Hashem and out of reverence for Hashem. Those are the two wings, love and reverence or fear or awe. Those are different words for the Hebrew word yira, depending on which mitzvah I'm engaged. Certain mitzvah uh, is the expression of love. I express my love to Hashem. A certain mitzvah I express more my fear of Hashem. When I say mitzvah, it doesn't only refer to the positive mitzvahs, it also refers to the negative mitzvahs, right? There are, there are the do's and the don't. By me abstaining from doing something that is a prohibition, I also fulfill, I fulfill my, my mitzvah through by not doing them. So if I am fulfilling Shabbat, I, there's a positive mitzvah of Shabbat of observing Shabbos, and then also I fulfill Shabbos by not going to work on Shabbos, by not violating the Shabbos. What is the motivating factor for me not to violate the Shabbos? <clears throat> so mainly it is out of fear of Hashem. I have a certain fear of Hashem that we already, already in Tanya over and over, we don't like to use the word fear because fear is actually not the proper, um, it's not the proper translation of yira here in the context of a mitzvah, because yira, fear means basically self-serving. I'm, 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 I'm fearful of God because God is the big man with a with a stick and I don't want to get hit, so I'm not going to get into trouble. I don't want to do it. Really, that, that basically means I care about myself. It's a self-serving. I don't want to get caught. I don't want to get hit. I don't want to get, you know, as in other, other circles, I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> I don't want to go to hell. Who wants to go to hell? You know, the guy who was a stingy, stingy miser, he, he had a lot of money, never gave to that, huh? And then... Um, he comes up to heaven. He dies. He comes up to heaven, and he gets uh, and, he, and and all the angels are in, in the court. You know, where we judge the person. Says, stingy miser, never did a mitzvah in his life. Doesn't deserve to go anywhere. Doesn't deserve to go to heaven. All of a sudden, one angel comes up and says, "You know, 
35 years ago, there was a cold winter and a guy knocked on his door and, and he said, I push a need that I need $5 for a little food. And he pulled out $5, the stingy man, one mitzvah, we found in his history, one mitzvah. And the whole commotion started, one mitzvah out of uh, 80 years, that should not give him a ticket to heaven. And uh, the other angel says, yeah, but the mitzvah is very important, and maybe it does. And a big debate started until one angel got up, went over to the guy, says, here, sir, take back your $5 and go to hell. <laughs> All right, another rabbi joke. There we go. Just uh, got to wake you up a bit. So let's go back a little bit more serious. But the idea is not, to, it's not about fear, inner fear. It's not fear. We never fear Hashem as an expression that I am afraid to get punished. That, yes, I won't say the word never. I would say this is a primitive fear. If that's where you're holding in your behavior, it's like a child, you begin, you begin on that level, right? If you want to try to get a person out of trouble and he's a criminal, you got to lock him up or give him really consequence to start, start with the process to start hit that he should eventually on his own realize to behave, not out of fear, but out of awe, out of respect. Let's think about our parents, right? Sometimes our parents you have a relationship where you're scared to get caught. But a deeper relationship is when you stand in the awe of your parents, which means that it, as we say in Yiddish, is pasach It's not befitting for me to behave in the presence of my parents. It doesn't befit. When we stand in the in the presence of greatness, we don't behave in a certain way because not because we're afraid. It doesn't bef- it's not befitting. So that's the that's the year aspect. The 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 the, 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 the when we talk about standing in the awe of reverence of Hashem. Okay, so we said so. Uh, so now that we have that established, he says that every mitzvah, no matter what, needs to have both. Needs to have love for Hashem and needs to have reverence to of Hashem. If we only have one, if you only have love for Hashem but there's lacking reverence of Hashem, it's it's like a bird with one wing. You're not elevating the mitzvah um, higher, and the reason is because again, um, mainly. What's the expression of reverence? We started with the meditation. How do I bring in more reverence in my life? So you said that the idea is to be become a servant to Hashem. Become a servant by Hashem by realizing that Hashem is in complete control, that Hashem uh, surrounds, surrounds you completely. Hashem is everywhere. Hashem watches everything. And we said four steps. And last week, we said four um, steps that you should think, four, medita- four parts to this meditation, and we called it, the four steps, we called it Kabbalat All. Kabbalat All in Hebrew means um, Kabbalah, the word Kabbalah, you all know what it means, right? No, it means the teaching of Kabbalah. Now, what does the word Kabbalah mean in its original? Kabbalah means to accept. That's why the teaching of Kabbalah is not a logic teaching, it's called accepting. It's accepting a, a certain information. In essence, true Kabbalah cannot be understood. It's more of a code. Okay, I don't want to confuse this. I'm not going to this topic now. We don't teach core Kabbalah. We teach Hasidism, which took the topics of Kabbalah and made it explainable. So it becomes personal. So now, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm talking about the concept. The word Kabbalah means to accept. All means to yoke, a yoke. Yoke, is that the word? You put a yoke on an animal. Kabbalat all to accept the oak of, of, the, of Hashem, his present, his, 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 his reality. Number one, to, com- to contemplate that God is all powerful. Number two, that he fills the entire space everywhere Hashem fills heaven and earth. Number three, that's not just not just that he fills every space, but number three, that he wants a personal relationship with you, which is a very, extremely a powerful idea, that he wants a relationship with you. Not just Hashem is everywhere. Yeah, Hashem is everywhere. Hashem is a creator of all. But more than that, Hashem wants a relationship with you. And number four, that everything matters to him. Everything, every little detail matters to him. There's nothing that doesn't matter. 
And we discuss it, how can such a great God really care if I put the chicken in the milk or the milk in the soup? God cares about the little details? Absolutely. You know why he cares? Because he chose to care. God who is infinite chose to have a relationship with you and God is in the details. Judaism is all about the details. Right, so you know the expression "the devil's in the details." Right, when you read a contract, you have to look at the details. We're not talking. This is Hashem is in the details, which is the beauty that you can find Hashem in every minute thing, and that's why every minute thing that we do in Judaism can and should be infused with this knowledge and with this meditation. So every experience in your life, no matter what you do has the ability to be an experience that is a godly experience. People ask, why do we have so many laws, how to go to the bathroom, after the bathroom, washing here, washing here, this blessing, even to the tie, how we tie our shoes. There's, the, there's different rituals, how we tie our shoes, first the right shoe, then the left shoe, but when you're not first the left, then the right, I'm saying, go in Jewish law and start reading. How to go to sleep, what we do in the bedroom, what we do in the kitchen, Got it? That's not it. That's not limiting. It's actually inviting Hashem in our life to every. And that's the that's part of this meditation process. This 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 knowledge. This this consciousness. Hashem is every moment involved in our life because he wants he wants to have a relationship and he chose and it matters to him. And that creates if we think about it, we meditate on this topic, that creates such a reverence that I am in the presence of Hashem every moment, and he wants a relationship with me, how humble that is. And with this, we start doing a mitzvah. In a sense, when I say, say a blessing, Baruch atah Hashem elokinu melech olam, that is the meditation of the mitzvah. Blessed are you, Hashem, God, universe, God the, the king of the universe, it's just encapsulating everything we just said. It's, it's blessing, which means it's me coming down, meaning connecting. Ata is the essence of Hashem. And Hashem Elokeinu, the two words in Hebrew that define Hashem in different ways, how Hashem has a personal relationship, king of the universe, creator of all, everywhere, with you. How do I express that? Because you have commanded me and you have sanctified me. You have chosen, you want a connection with me. Via lighting the Shabbat candles, via doing the Hamotzi, via the, the Kiddush that I'm doing now. Every mitzvah has that meditation, but we just don't say it. We don't think about it. We just say it. Right? We, don't, we don't think. Start, start and think, and this is the meditation. Let's move on to, that's meditation number one, refers to reverence. How do I bring reverence into every mitzvah experience? Because that reverence I need to have not only to stop me from doing something that's inappropriate, but also when I do something that's positive. So when I do a mitzvah, when I give tzedakah, when I do eat matzah, it becomes an experience out of reverence for Hashem. And it's a humbling experience. And that's why my tzedakah does not come from an ego-driven place, but from a humble place. As we're going to see next on page 498. <clears throat> Section three of reverence meditation. I'm going to read a bit. The first meditation above was a basic preparedness and willingness to let God into your life, to accept God's sovereign authority. A second phase, which you will aim for in the following three meditations, is a feeling of genuine reverence, a deeper connection, where you progressively absorb and internalize the reality of God and pull upon yourself God's blessings in blessed infinite light. So you should also contemplate how the blessed infinite light, which fills all the worlds and transcends all worlds, is the divine will expressed in an undiluted fashion in the Torah you're reading in, the, in its text and ideas, or in the tzitzit or tefillin you are putting on, for example. And by reading this Torah text or putting on these tzitzit or tefillin, you pull upon yourself God's blessed light. The way this works, how does that work? When you're pulling God's blessed light, 
when I read texts of Torah, how does that work? So he explains this way, the, the way this works is that the light is pulled upon your divine soul, a piece of God above, which is inside your body and engages your body in the mitzvah act, causing you to be absorbed and lose your separate identity within God's blessed light. As your ego weakens and more of your inner being is receptive to God's light, you will begin to lose a sense of separateness from God, which each mitzvah, you open yourself up to the light which is shining on you at that moment, rendering yourself translucent to the divine. Obviously, this takes a lot more spiritual work than our first meditation. It's a kind of phase two in your relationship with God, where the ego shifts from merely recognizing there is a higher power and now aims to vacate its, percept its perception of separate self, you begin to shed the urge to do anything other than act as an instrument for the divine will, becoming absorbed and losing your separate identity within God's blessed light. So phase one, we said, imagine we're starting from scratch where I need to accept Hashem's sovereignty, which means I surrender. I, I accept there's a God here. That's, step, that's the meditation number one we learned last week. Phase two, step two, is to take this a step further by now what he calls absorbing God's light. How do we absorb God's light? So think about your neshama. Think about your soul as being the antenna, right? The antenna that is that is connects now with Hashem through my performance of the mitzvah. So my soul wants to do a mitzvah. My soul is begging my body to do the mitzvah, right? So it's, we talk about animal soul, godly soul. So the godly soul, the neshama, has to convince the animal soul to stop performing the mitzvah. But the, 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 the light that, it, that gives life to the mitzvah is the godly soul, the neshama. So the neshama now uh, gets this infusion, this connection to the infant light. And as a result, it absorbs that infant light where it becomes less it becomes less separate. What does it separate mean? If if my godly soul, my animal soul, are always fighting, always fighting, right? My godly soul, in a sense, is not as strong consciously. It's not as strong because my animal soul is in the driving seat. My animal soul says, "You are separate from God. You are you are your own person. You I'm an ego. You have an ego, and 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 that's that's that, that is completely country." contradiction to what Hashem wants or my soul wants. But once I engage my soul into the mitzvah, now that the light of Hashem that penetrates inside of me and become trans, this is the word translucent. Translucent is a beautiful word I use this here, which we talked about in the, in, in the chapters in the 20s, about the word holiness. What does it mean, holy? What does it mean to become holy? We use the word transparent or translucent. And when you look at, at this item or you look at yourself, it becomes trans, you become a, a become a vehicle to Hashem, where your ego diminish or completely leaves leaves yourself. You no longer it's not about you. You become completely surrender and 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 shine shine Hashem's light through you in a very in a very humble way. And uh, and, and that's that that happens via this meditation that you that you have worked on yourself, that you have accepted that, and you have kind of tamed your animal to absorb the same light, and now you can serve Hashem even deeper. It gives another um, it gives an example of a specific mitzvah. It's going to go into like mainly two mitzvahs, and he wants to give a case study. How do we, this meditation, how does it work? Because we have so many mitzvahs we do. And, you know, so why don't I just focus on one mitzvah? This will be my mitzvah I connect to Hashem, right? Let's say my mitzvah will be every day to pray, which is a mitzvah. That's my mitzvah. But we know, in addition to pray, you got to put a talit, you got to put on tefillin, you got to you gotta say the Shema, you got to learn Torah, you got to get tzedakah. Why do I have to do all these mitzvahs? Let me pick one mitzvah. That one mitzvah will be my connector, my connector between my antenna, my soul, and Hashem. It's going to explain that every mitzvah touches on another part because every part of my body, every part of my animal soul needs trans, needs a transparent uh, experience, needs to have that translucent experience. Every mitzvah, every mitzvah is unique by touching another part. As we're going to take the tefillin and mezuz and, and the talis example. 499, section four. 
a reverence meditation for tefillin. In the particular case of tefillin, <clears throat> contemplate that chachma, inquiry, and bina, cognition powers of your divine soul, shall lose their identity and be absorbed in the chachma and bina powers of the blessed infinite one. What does that mean? Where do you put on tefillin? The feeling go on ahead, right? The feeling go on ahead and, 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 and on our arm. Why did film go on ahead? It, it has to do with our chachma and bina, with our intellect, with our cognition powers, our wisdom, our inquiry, which is chachma and bina, which is called the cognition powers. That we should take those and transform them and that they should lose their identity and become absorbed that my chachma should not be my ego chachma, my ego inquiry, my ego cognition, but it should transform that it should now be able to flow the divine wisdom, the divine, that should, but my, my mind should be, uh, should, be, should be thinking about not what I, uh, what's about me, but what is, what, what, how can I be an expression with my intellect um, for Hashem, and that's a power. That's how tefillin is is a is a daily reminder, which is not the conversation today. Why women don't have that obligation? Because women don't need the reminder. I said reminder, because women don't need the reminder. They are much more spiritual inclined. They are from the level of bina. So because women are more spiritual, putting on tefillin would actually be a will be an insult to say to the woman, you need a reminder. But men, we have a lot more ego, correct, women? Is that true? Right? We have a lot more, oh, yes, you know, there you go. <laughs> so we, that, that is kind of the meditation for to fill in. Just a classic example. A mitzvah, as we have just seen, continue inside, dissolves your body and soul into, into God's light. To fill in targets the mind in particular, allowing your mental powers to be raised up and absorbed in God's mental powers. And similar goes with the hand to fill and the arm to fill which is by the heart, which is which absorbs the emotional powers, that my emotions should not be ego-driven, but God-driven. So since the Zohar teaches God's chachma and bina powers take expression, in particular, in two of the four sacred passages written on parchment inside the tefillin. In tefillin, there's four passages. One of them is Kadesh, the passage sanctified to me every firstborn, the first of each womb, has the energy of God's Chachma, which we know the Chachma is the first stage of God's of divine emanation towards the creation. God created the world from Chachma. God thought, had a thought, Chachma, a, a, a thought, and he created out of the thought. The word Chachma has the word Ma, Koach Ma, what is it? Creating something from nothing. We as well, Chachma is the first level of our intellect of when we think of an idea, when we create an idea, right? You're thinking out of something and you create something out of nothing. That's the Chachma idea. So, but my Chachma, we want it to be Kaddish. It should be sanctified. And, um, and, 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 and the divine emanation towards the creation, which like a womb, opens the whole flow of mercy and supernal light. And the passage inside fill in the beginning, there will come a time when you will be brought by God into the land of Canaan, has the energy of God's Bina. Bina hinted by the, to the fact that the Torah mentions the exodus of Egypt 50 times corresponding to the 50 gates of Bina. And, and, and so the result of your meditation, the first to pass your tefillin, should be the feeling that you're not going to use your soul's chachma and bina for anything other than God alone. So, so basically, the passage is in tefillin, inside the box. You know, there's something inside the box. What's inside the box? Have you seen it? The fill that have, have, has a box here. What's inside the box? It's a box, it's a scroll. Just like the mezuzah scroll, it's a scroll of parchment. Um, I don't have it right in front of me here. Uh, I have an open one in Chabad. But basically, it, it's a roll of parchment. And if you open it up, the parchment 
has to have four passages from Torah. One of them is the Shema, just like in the Tefillin. But, but Tefillin, just like in the Mezuzah, Mezuzah has one, Tefillin has, four, has three other passages. One of them is Kaddish, one is Kimbo Haikiyachal. But I, again, the point here is really that each one is talking to the concept of what Tefillin, the mitzvah of Tefillin expresses or tries to accomplish. It's a part of a meditation to elevate my chachma, my understanding and wisdom and, 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 and cognitive powers to Hashem. We can go. We can have a, a class on film itself, which is fascinating because we just don't understand. We're just doing this, but what is it? Nobody taught me what that means, right? In Hebrew school, they say put on film. But message put on film. But what does it mean? Is there meditation? Where is the meditation? It's right here. It's right here. Again, I understand why this is a a chapter that is 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 learned by heart in the yeshiva world. So we can we can become a bar mitzvah boy. That's very deep for a thirty year old. But if you remember, by my son and his bar mitzvah, he learned a Hasidic discourse by heart. Um, every 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 bar mitzvah boy in Chabad, have, we have a tradition that we do, that we study a discourse, which is a Hasidic, a, a, a mystical explanation on tefillin by heart. He learned it word by word by heart. My my lady, so did I when I was thirty. When I was 13, I understood maybe 1% what I was saying. I just learned the words. But as I, but, but it became ingrained in my, in my brain. If, I learned, if you learn something by heart, meaning word by word by heart, in Hebrew, not on text, not in addition to Torah reading, in addition to the half Torah, to, to, to learn something by heart, it becomes imprinted in your brain, especially if you're a child. So when I learned with my son, 20... Right, 30, uh, what, what, um, almost 30 years later, I still remember word by word, but now all of a sudden I'm studying it because I'm studying it, not just the words. I know, I know already the information behind from learning a lot of mystical teaching over my years. So now I can understand what it means. And in yeshiva, as we get older, maybe it's 14, 15, 16, they start learning Tanya, they start explaining that. Now, when they put on fill in, it becomes a a real personal experience. Personal meaning it becomes it becomes a transformative experience. So the problem in shul, that's a problem that I know Leona always complains. We don't, we, we come Shabbos service, it's three hours of, of davening, a lot of davening. We don't have time to really um, talk about, teach this. It's not the time to teach, the time to teach is on Monday. So when you come on Shabbos to shul, you already know this. So when you daven, when you say, not just words, not even just translation, but understanding that it's all part of a process of transformation. So, um, good thing is you guys are all retired, right? You have a lot of time. Yeah? Go online, study. There's so much. This is, uh, this is, uh, this is so beautiful, so rich. Okay, um, in bottom 499, worshiping God doesn't mean that you lose all sense of rationality and intuition. God doesn't want you to become a robot. He gave you, he's not saying to, to close down. He gave you mental powers so that you dedicate them to his worship. And putting out the fill-in helps you to do that because it floods your power of inquiry and cognition with divine light. In the second half of this meditation, we turn to the power to fill in to refine your emotions. As we learned above, the transition from thinking to feeling takes place via the agency of das, recognition, discernment, through which ideas become personally relevant. And this leads to the entire range of human emotion, which broadly speaking, fall into the two guided categories, right, in emotions, chesed, which is love, giving, which is the right hand, and the gavura is discipline, fear, pulling back. Those are two emotions, the two main emotions. We have seven emotions, sub-emotions, but those are the two emotions, right? Similarly, you should contemplate when putting on to fill in that your soul's power of das 
what is Das? Das is level three in, in, the, in the intellectual process, right? Those who don't know, the word Chabad is the acronym of Chachma, Cha, Bina, Das, Chabad. That's what Chabad is about. Chabad is, to, is, is the philosophy to, to, the, to understand intellectually through the process of Chachma, Bina, Das, Torah and its mitzvahs. That's, that's why it's called Chabad. Nina, did you know that, Nina? And you joined Chabad without knowing that. <laughs> and we accept you for that. <laughs> now you know. <laughs> it's really all about, you know, this is, all, it's all about real meditation. It's all about the med to, to, to make, to every move, every mitzvah, every experience, every experience in life should be through this three levels. Chachma bin Das, in very broad terms, in very easy terms, is, on the, is is um, chachma is, is wisdom is the, is the first idea. Bina is taking it apart, understanding, um, is taking apart the idea, the details. And das translate as knowledge is connecting the idea into your emotions. And das is the neck. I'm going to show you my film quick. <clears throat> I'll show you the. When we put on to fill in, the, I know my camera's below right here. Oop. I can zoom up here. Boom, there we go. I'm going to keep it right next to my head. So you know, the fill in goes on your head, but then there's a knot behind that goes around it. Where does the knot go? It goes right on the beginning of your neck. So he's talking here about the third level. Talking about the, um, um, the word das um, is is the is actually connect, connecting your intellect to your emotion, which is so critical. Because if you don't take the meditation, you can have a meditation, you can understand it, right? Intellectually, you can understand it, but some people are disconnected from bringing it to their emotions. The whole key is to bring it into your love and reverence that we talked earlier. But that goes through first meditation and through understanding. All right. And um, so when he says again, and since, since it is Das that gives rise to all emotions, beginning with Chesek Vur, when your Das becomes absorbed in God, it automatically incorporates your Chesed and Gevura, which are the reverence and love in your heart, when you put on tefillin, all this becomes absorbed in God's supernal das, which incorporates his chesed and gevura. The two other passions tefillin express God's chesed and gevura. Shema, the passage beginning here, Israel, you should love, right? Vera hafta, correspond to chesed. And the passage and beginning of, uh, and if you will listen, correspond to gevura, since it speaks of divine anger, but we not let your heart be lured away, then the anger of God will be kindled against you. And this entire meditation is really an elaboration of the basic requirements stated in the Code of Jewish Law, that when putting on the filling, you ought to contemplate that you are placing your heart and mind exclusively in God's service. So that is to do with the filling. Here's another, another case study, and that is the mitzvah of talit. What is a talit? We take a talit and wrap it around. So he says, so when you're wrapped in a talit, and don't with tzitzit carry out the following meditation. If somewhat perplexing that the Tanya offers this meditation for the Talis after the meditation for tefillin. Practically speaking, we put on the, the Talis first before the tefillin. So it seems that we're speaking here of a Talis meditation after tefillin have been put on. In other words, this is more advanced phase two meditation, where God's light is absorbed not only into your heart and your mind with filling, but into your entire being through the talus, as we shall see. So what is the talus meditation? So he's saying as follows, contemplate. What was written in the Zohar, page 501, that when doing this mitzvah, you ought to draw upon yourself God's sovereign authority. The difference between phase one and two is that in phase one, you merely accept upon yourself God's sovereign authority, with in phase two, your soul powers lose their separate identity and are absorbed in God's light as you become one with God. So 
this final meditation completes this process to draw upon yourself God's light upon your whole being so that you will lose your separate identity completely and absorb within God's blessed light. So contemplate that even though God's authority rules over all worlds, nevertheless, he has specified his desire to be worshipped by us through Torah and through observing this mitzvah, your whole being will internalize this reality. So basically, Tal is basically is phase two. In, both of them are kind of phase two. We said phase one is accept Hashem as, author, as, as their authority. Phase two was bring Hashem into your life, right? Not just to accept it, but actually bring it to your life to, to, and to diminish your ego and become a vehicle for Hashem. To fill in, takes care of your mind, takes care of your emotion, love and reverence for Hashem. And to tell his idea is to is to is to completely wrap yourself around with 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 to be absorbed in God's light completely. So the mind and the heart is the vehicle that brings us to that realization that now I'm ready to kind of re, uh, let go and, and 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 embrace myself or envelop myself in Hashem's light. So. Um, Contemplate that even though God's authority rules over all worlds, right? We said that what? Uh, we already said that, right? But nevertheless, he has specified his desire to be worshipped by us because that's that's the key. It's not enough just to accept Hashem as the ruler of the world and Hashem is everywhere. But more than that, that in addition to this, Hashem wants a relationship with me, with each of us. You think about Hashem wants a relation with me. That's how, how empowering that is. And he wants to be fully absorbed in me. He's waiting for me to, to be open to that. How awesome that is. And, and, to, and, and, and through the mitzvah, I can eternalize this, this light um, uh, with my whole being. So most mitzvahs have a specific theme relating to a particular element of worship. But even though it's just one mitzvah, the Talas have the theme of accepting God's authority and worshiping Him in general. That's because the Talas involves your whole body, representing the alignment of your whole being with God. And again, by the way, side note, women are a walking Talas. Women, because the Nisham is so much more powerful, they are enveloped with this, with this concept inherently in who they are. Same thing with a keeper. That's why we're a keeper, right? To think if Hashem is above me, Hashem is surrounding me. I need men need reminders. Men need reminders. Women giving them reminders would be denigrating. So and so putting on the and if you want to put on talis, by the way, go ahead. You can put on talis. No, it's not a prohibition. Put on a talis. Women can also put on tefillin. It's not encouraged because it's not looked at as something holy for a woman to do. The woman should, should should really express them expressing through that will limiting who they are in a sense. And understanding that empowers the idea of what it's all about. Oh, you know, why can I do this? Right? It's not about you can do it. Why do it? Zunta hey, but why should we do something that will actually den denigrate the identity of the uni of the unique um, spiritual status a woman has? So the mitzvah the woman has. For example, lighting candles Friday night, or going to a mikvah, or giving chala, goes to the core, goes to the core of, of Hashem's presence. Because the women have the power to bring extra light. Men don't have the power. Men have to accept the light. They have to absorb the light. They don't have so much power to bring in extra light. Women were given that on Friday night. A woman has a power to give birth. Man doesn't have the power to give birth. That's why a woman has a unique mitzvah going to a mikvah. Mikvah, by the way, is enveloping your entire body in water, in holy water. Is idea of complete surrender to become one with Hashem, to then give in the gift of birth. Because when you surrender, become one with Hashem, your soul has the power of Hashem, power of infinity, power to create, and that gift was given to a woman. So putting, let's finish the last point here. 
So putting on the talus is similar to the idea you shall surely place a king over yourself. The verse you shall surely place a king over yourself implies that until this point, you were merely willing to have God as your king. But it's now when wearing a talus that you are entering fully into this relationship. Um, so, oops, it's late. Okay, we're going to stop here. Um, we'll continue next week. Um, continue next week on this topic here. And hopefully next week we can uh, wrap up chapter 41. Probably takes another two weeks to Hanukkah. It's a long chapter, okay, no matter what. All right, any questions on this? Did, uh, did, did you learn something? Did we learn something new today? No. <laughs> Again, th these are these are deep concepts. These are things that you need to read, sit on, study over, meditate. Um, meditation is not an easy thing. Not an easy thing at all. And also, here's really the crux. We're going to learn this in our meditation course. Jewish meditation is not to make you feel better. It's not about making you feel better. It's not about making you feel more at peace. Self, that's self-serving. Jewish meditation is to empower you, is to give you, to, to, to give you the, the, um, the opening to your soul so you can be an ambassador to Hashem. And when you have, when, when, when that happens, then you're then you when you go into the world, you know you you know you know your place, you know why you're here, you know what you're supposed to do, and you're not afraid. It takes care of, of stress, it takes care of, of, of anxieties, it takes care of, of a lot of things that people who want to do meditation try to find. But meditation is not about um, becoming less of yourself necessarily. And when I say less of yourself, like to, yeah, it's less into your ego, but it's becoming true of yourself. And our mitzvahs and our prayers specifically, each are the vehicles, how we take the meditation and allow us to express it and to, and to use those tools. So help me God. Any other questions? Enjoy, have a wonderful uplifting week. Tomorrow, Rivka will give the class, God willing, we have the schmooze. Uh, next week, actually, we're going to um, celebrate the Tanya. And next week on Monday night and Tuesday is the 19th of Kislev, which is co coined as the new year for, for the Tanya, the new year for the Hasidic Chabad movement. It is the day that the author of the Tanya had a major miracle. He was, a, he, he was uh, in, when he was in Russia, he was arrested by the Tsar's uh, um, government for spreading this type of teaching, specifically this type of teaching, and uh, and the, and there was a there was a lot of opposition amongst Jews against the teaching of Tanya, against the Alter Rebbe, to the point that he was arrested, and on the 19th Kislev he was released, which was a tremendous miracle if you know anything about Russian prisons, and uh, and after that he actually started writing the Tanya. That's a, that's a day we celebrate very strongly. I look forward next week to do some type of celebration. Yeah, Bella. I read that the 10 of Kislev is the celebration of Alter Rebbe. What's the difference between 10 and 19? The 10 of Kislev, which was yesterday, is the celebration of his son, who was the second Chabad Chabad, okay. who also had a similar experience. He was also arrested. Almost every Chabad Rebbe was, was sit, sat in prison. Okay. Not, not because of any criminal activities, because they were because they were spreading Torah. I think it was the uh, kid's story, and, and every almost every rebbe up until our rebbe, because you know you know it's, uh, it, our rebbe who was born 1902 in in Ukraine, and uh, later went to study in Paris and uh, Germany. It was a cute story. He was studying with Rabbi Soloveitchik. Uh, Soloveitchik was the, was the founder of the modern Orthodox movement who uh, founded Yeshiva University in New York. 
a giant, a giant of a scholar and Torah scholar, one of the greatest minds. And they, start, they started to get it at university with the Rebbe. You can imagine the two greatest Jewish minds starting to get in a secular, in a secular setting, but in their free time, they were learning Torah. Rabbi Soleitchik said that the Rebbe would sit with the Talmud in the in the very uh, high academic uh, classes, and he, he would have always the best the best uh, the best grades. The Rebbe became a, you know, the Rebbe was an engineer later on, and when he came to America, but but uh, he, was, he said it was Purim. Rabbi Soleitchik was Purim. I think it was Paris, and the Rebbe wanted to wanted to have a nice Purim. It was a very happy Purim. And the Rebbe went out on the streets, I think with a bottle of vodka to give l'chaim to other people. And that was a crime in Paris. So they arrested the Rebbe on Purim night. Police came and arrested the Rebbe for a few hours and then bailed him out. So the Rabbi Soloveitchik, this was before he was Rebbe, he was young, he was in his 20s. So Rabbi Soloveitchik told the Rebbe, uh, now you can become a Rebbe. You were in jail, you can become a Rebbe. <laughs> But, uh, but if you look at the story of the Alter Rebbe, which we'll uh, maybe make some time next week, I really, um, what I would like to do next week on Tuesday, um, perhaps during uh, Rifka, after the Rifka's class in the Shmuz, I know some of you don't, can't make it, is to, is to, is to fabrang a little bit. But maybe we could do it at the end of our Tanya class as well and uh, make, you know, tap into the energy of that day. Judaism, a day in the Jewish calendar is very special. And there's a special day that is connected to us as students of Tanya. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. And, and, and last thing, if you notice, there is a daily cycle of learning Tanya. The Tanya is divided into the whole year. So if, if you want to study Tanya, the whole Tanya, all the five volumes, um, you could do it in one year. And we actually finishing it on the 19th of Kislev next week. We begin again on the 19th of Kislev. Um, so if you want to jump in and read it every day, and on, on, there's an app now that you can listen to the class. You can um, you can go back to our classes. But there's so many great teachers, so you can read the explanations and and review Tanya. So it's, if you learn every day, it's about a page of Tanya. I have a page pending on the day. That's a great, it's a great, it's a great, uh, it's, it's the best thing to do. Um, actually, it's encouraged strongly to do it. And um, all right, wishing, wishing everyone a beautiful, uplifting day. Thank you. Thank you. All the best.